again. Uh, Holly here, NRTF. I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Bristow, uh, who is Director of Strategic Partnerships at Arts Council England. Um, Paul has been Director um, of Strategic Partnerships at A since 2012. He leads the Arts Council's Policy on Place, Local Government, Economic Growth and Rural and Urban Agendas. Uh, Paul developed the first Arts Council position statement on rural communities and has led the delivery of key Arts Council investment programmes, amongst many other things. Uh, welcome, Paul. Thank you for being here. Yeah. I will leave it over to you. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Holly. Um, and thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, but the circumstances I'm talking to you in just show the strange times in which we're living. I think this is the second conference presentation I've done from my spare room, um, surrounded by piles of children's laundry, which is a, an odd place to be in. Um, but I think it just shows that none of this expected 2020 to pan out just like it has. Um, but many of us who've worked for organisations will have done scenario planning and horizon scanning exercises in the past. Um, and we'll have spent time thinking about the impact of technological change, a more diverse society, environmental problems. And in recent years, we've been thinking a lot about Brexit. So we've all been thinking about change for a long while. And throughout, we've been living with change. The way people live, create and consume culture and the places and communities they live in never stand still. But if any of us had put global pandemic into our lists of things that might happen, I doubt we could have predicted what life has been like. So it's been tough. We've been isolated from friends and loved ones. We've been, able, we've been unable to live the usual rhythms of life. And whether people have been working from home while trying to school the kids or been facing relentless demands as key workers in a society under stress, the experience of the last six months surely defied anyone's foresight. One thing I've learned is that while we can expect change, merely anticipating it does not mean we can easily grasp the ways in which it can be unpredictable, unexpected and difficult. And this makes talking about today's theme, future-proofing the rural touring sector, a real challenge. And this is despite the fact that the Arts Council has spent the last three years thinking really hard about the future. Our new 10-year strategy, Let's Create, was published in January, and it was a long while in the making. We undertook evidence gathering and research into the issues facing the cultural sector, the Arts Council and the people and the communities and the country that we serve. We reviewed progress against the ambitions of our existing strategy. We consulted widely and extensively with creatives and artists, with those working in and with the cultural sector, with government and local government, and crucially, with the public. And we thought about the decade ahead of us and the challenges and the opportunities that it might bring. We took all that we had learned from this work and we identified a set of key issues that we wanted to tackle. We call this the case for change, and it's got six components. Firstly, most people have active cultural lives, yet there is a gap between what people do and enjoy and what they sometimes perceive culture or the arts to be. And we're concerned that there are still socioeconomic and geographic inequalities in their levels of engagement with publicly funded culture. Moreover, we want to take account of the fact that cultural opportunities for children and young people are not the same across the country and are affected by where those children and young people live. And we all have to acknowledge that there remain challenges relating to diversity across the creative industries and the publicly funded cultural sector. There is also an issue that the, that the business models in the cultural sector are often fragile and inflexible, and that there is a perception that there has been a retreat from risk-taking and innovation. We tested these issues with many stakeholders, and we believe they make up a fundamental case for change to guide the Arts Council's strategy. So even before COVID, we had an eye on the future and a sense of a journey for the sector to go on. And then the pandemic hit. At the Arts Council, we firmly believe that the case for change we have set out remains valid. But of course, we now need to consider it within the context of COVID, particularly what the unforeseen impacts of this have been. In fact, we think many of the challenges we identified have become more urgent and the evidence we've been assessing bears this out. The start of lockdown or the 23rd of March and ongoing social distancing have had a huge effect, which we've all been experiencing in our professional and personal lives. It turned out that the business models in our sector did in, in many cases prove to be fragile. 
In this August, a survey by the Office for National Statistics found that 23% of businesses in arts, entertainment and recreation were at risk of, of insolvency, compared to 11% in the economy as a whole. The survey also found that this sector had the highest proportion of businesses at 76%, saying that footfall had reduced. Interestingly, this sector was also more reliant on government support than other sectors, with 96% 96, 96 of businesses applying to furlough staff. And we know that with 73% of the arts workforce being freelance, that the, the impact of the government's self-employment income support scheme has been absolutely fundamental. And things are going to continue to be diff difficult. The continuation of social distancing and now the impact of a three-tiered approach to local restrictions will make it difficult for cultural organisations to operate. If we think about our audiences, consumer confidence is low, Research by Minitel predicts that the out-of-home leisure industry will not return to 2019 levels until 2024. And cultural organisations which attract tourists will have to deal with inbound tourism to the UK, projected to be 58% lower this year than in 2019. And the challenges aren't just to how we operate. The social and economic effects of COVID exacerbate the issues of equality that our case for change highlight highlighted. We are absolutely committed to ensuring that everyone, no matter who they are or where they live, has access to high quality cultural opportunities. But the context for this ambition has shifted. The health impacts of COVID have not been evenly distributed. Some places have seen higher incidences of the disease, some demographic groups are at greater risk, and people with disabilities and life limiting conditions have had their opportunities reduced. We're in the middle of a major rise in unemployment with the economy in some places taking a far harder hit than elsewhere with serious implications for the government's desire for leveling up and crucially for the life chances of a generation of our young people. And from this, there are major concerns about the impacts on mental health, particularly for young people and those already at risk of exclusion. So while we couldn't have predicted the pandemic nor the ways in which it would play out, we still think that the case for change we have identified holds true. In fact, Given what we've learned over the last few months, it has redoubled our commitment to the ambitions that we set out in Let's Create. And fundamental to this are our investment principles. If we are to achieve the vision we've set out in Let's Create, both the Arts Council and the organisations and the people we invest in will have to change. And we've got four investment principles set out in Let's Create that will steer that change. Firstly, ambition and quality. We want to see cultural organisations that are ambitious and committed to improving the quality of their work. Secondly, dynamism. We want to see cultural organisations that are dynamic and able to respond to the challenges of the coming decade. Thirdly, environmental sustainability. We want to see cultural organisations active, actively leading an approach to sustainability. And finally, inclusivity and relevance. We want England's diversity to be reflected in the organisations and people we fund and the culture that they produce. And these are the principles underpinning what we want to achieve. Of course, principles are only half the story. And you have to have a plan and some actions to deliver them. And we had intended to publish a detailed delivery plan setting out the actions that we would be taking. But the pandemic meant that we've had to postpone this. In addition, we're awaiting the outcome of the forthcoming comprehensive spending review so that we know what resources we'll have available to us. So in many ways, the future remains uncertain and we're still working through the implications of that. But even in the depths of a pandemic, we're committed to the ambitions of Let's Create because we believe that the case for change addresses the right issues and our investment principles give us an approach to realising our ambitions. And while the pandemic has shown up challenges in our sector and society, it's also given us a sense of the change we want to see. There are experiences we can build on and achievements we can emulate. If you look outside of our sector, we've seen people working across the public sector stepping up. The Nightingale, the Nightingale hospitals were set up speedily when needed. Furloughing has rolled out very quickly and the Cultural Recovery Fund is making its first payments this month. Local government proved itself equal to the task, providing food and support to those who were shielding. And I think really importantly, in almost every community, we saw mutual aid groups set up, helping the vulnerable and the isolated, a real revival of voluntary action and a demonstration of compassion. And our sector, has been absolutely central to this. Distributing creativity kits to young children, connecting people with online arts and culture, and bringing together volunteers to help local communities. We've seen the best of our sector in recent months, and we should be proud of that. 
It can be an inspiration for the future that we want to see and the world that we want to create. So where does rural touring fit into this picture? I think it's at the heart of the changes we want. But again, we have to look at the challenges, the issues and the opportunities we face now and into the future. Everything I've spoken about in terms of the case for change and the impact of the pandemic will affect rural touring and we need to take that into account. We know as well that there will be particular impacts upon the rural touring sector and we need to talk to you about them. Amongst the things that we're thinking about now are the support that local authorities provide for rural touring. It's going to be under huge pressure in the coming years and this will be a major issue that we'll need to navigate together. Similarly, the voluntary and community infrastructure of our rural communities rests in large part on older people giving up their time. The Rural Services Network recognise that this is a big challenge for rural communities with a group of people who may not be able to volunteer as they have been if social distancing continues. And the economy of many rural areas is going to suffer with declining tourism, cancellation of festivals and shortages of seasonal labour. And then in particular places, we look at high streets and market towns at risk of further decline as retail and hospitality suffer with particular difficulties for the village pub. And there is a real risk to the economic future of coastal communities and seaside towns. So these are particular challenges that rural communities will face. Lots of stakeholders are talking about at the moment, and no doubt you'll be able to tell us of others. We need to talk about them. But as we look to the future, they have to be balanced with the extraordinary strengths of rural touring. We must not lose sight of the fact that rural touring is part of a strong and vibrant rural cultural sector. Cultural participation is higher amongst people living in rural areas than those who live in urban areas. And this has been consistently so uh, in evidence that we've been collecting for the last 15 years. We've got to remember as well that the infrastructure at the heart of rural communities is strong and has re proved remarkably resilient. This month, Action for Communities in Rural England published their annual survey of villages and community halls. They found that 50% regularly host cultural performances, 20% of them have a permanent stage, and a third of them host regular dance classes for children. This is a real strength and a huge source of cultural potential in our villages and market towns. And I've got to praise NRTF, a really strong and effective organisation providing good support in developing the sector. I'm in awe of NRTF's influence. And when I talk to officials in DEFRA, they always know and value rural touring. And this is pretty much because NRTF colleagues are always telling them about it. And we value the input that NRTF, NRTF and other colleagues give to us. So along with the other members of our Rural uh, Arts Council Rural Stakeholders Group, they're a powerful and influential voice who help us deliver our thinking about how we serve rural communities and who will have a big part to play in the delivery of Let's Create. So when I think of the ambitions of our new strategy, I think about some of the fantastic organisations delivering rural touring. Rural touring companies are really well placed to demonstrate to the whole cultural sector how we can think about and take forward our investment principles. So much of the work of the rural touring sector in recent years gives pointers to how we can realise our ambitions in the future. So I think about projects like the In Crowd, working with the pub as the hub, demonstrating how new partnerships will enable culture to do more things for more people in places that they live. I think about the National Dance Touring Initiative, it's done so many good things, but for me, it's perhaps best summed up as an effective example of how rural touring can work with leading art form organisations and bring together ambition, effective support, and crucially, a commitment to diversity. So to conclude, 2020 was always going to be a significant year for future proof in the cultural sector. The Arts Council's new strategy was going to be a moment to set out a vision for the future based on an evidence case for change and a clear plan for how we move ahead together. The pandemic meant that we had to revisit that and our delivery plan has had to be momentarily paused. COVID brought new challenges to the fore, but all the while emphasizing the critical importance of the issues we already knew we had to tackle, particularly inequalities within our sector and the fragility of its business models. But if COVID has taught us anything, it is certainly that culture is vital to people immeasurably life in our communities both in good times and in crisis therefore we're sticking to our vision for the future of culture in england and we're firming up our plans now about how we will realize this and we want to do that in partnership with you rural touring is very much at the heart of what we want to see thank you for listening